we're continuing Shtisel. This is our last um, our last meeting, and I just want to make two uh, note two things. Um, number one, throughout the throughout the um, throughout the uh, sessions, I've been talking about the, the Shtisel family as Hasidim. It's someone brought it to my attention that, that that's not so clear. They're they're Hasids. They're more Haredi. They're more ultra orthodox. So that was a mistake. Uh, they're they're more they're more ultra orthodox. They're ultra orthodox has many different segments in Israel, and I really can't get into that. Each one is uh, each one dresses differently, and uh, is different uh, as different rabbis. So the Shtisel family, although they look like Hasidim to some extent, they're more Jerusalem Haredim, if, and that might not mean anything to you, but it's a little bit different because they don't have the whole hierarchy in their family of the Rebbe and everybody following the Rebbe. Um, it's a little bit different. Um, so just want to point that out. Um, it's like a class within itself trying to define the different sectors within orthodoxy. And we're not, I'm not even talking about modern orthodoxy or anything else. I'm talking about like ultra orthodoxy. In Israel is different than in America. There's a lot to talk about. So I just want to point that out. Another thing is I talked about dreams last class and how dreams are central. I just wanted to... Um, just note that I, I was really referring to, and I didn't, have a, I didn't word it this way at that time, but dreams and visions. So throughout where I'm gonna show you, there are multiple visions that people had throughout Shtisel and dreams. So it kinda, I kinda put them together, but I didn't name that last time. All right, so with that, uh, with all that being said, one more thing is I was, I was hoping to talk about women's head coverings today. Um, I'm not sure we're gonna have time, but I just wanna note uh, that that is an really interesting topic and um, so I'm just gonna to try to meet everybody again because it keeps, all right. So it's a really interesting topic and it goes from the very beginning of the show all the way till the end of the second season. Have anybody seen it? Um, does anybody remember when Shulam finally buys the painting? He buys the paint, his son's painting and then he paints over his, his, his wife of blessed memories, uh, exposed hair. And so <laughs> that's how they left us until the third season is about to happen. So um, there's a lot connected to that. I really wanted to talk about that. I'll just name one or two things and then um, we'll go into the, the topics that I have laid out for us. Because um, I actually did a little bit of research on this. I know a lot about kippahs. I know about hats. I know a little bit about strimals, but I never wore one. That's the furry hat. Um, uh, not only because I'm vegan, but for other reasons. <laughs> um, but uh, they can get very expensive, by the way. But another thing you get very expensive are women's wigs. So uh, I'll just, I, I did, so because I don't know as much about it, aside from the texts, I made a few calls to women who go with head coverings, um, some with wigs, some with, that's called a shaitel, others go with a tichel, which is uh, like, just like a, a, a wrapping. Um, can be, those can be extremely fancy too. Um, and um, I spoke with them to ask them, not halachically, there's a lot of details halachically uh, as to why one does it, um, if it's from the from the if it's rabbinic or if it's from the Torah, but I asked them like about their experience with it, like what what do they experience when they wear when they wear a head covering? Um, so one one woman shared with me that she ha happens to sell wigs. First off, she said a lot of the wigs are. I asked like what are the wigs made from? It's like a, it's a bit, pretty basic question because I don't really know. So she said they're either made from human hair that's purchased from like purchased from China. And then they're like uh, exported, um, and they can get, it can get really expensive, up to six six thousand dollars for a wig you can pay, but it could be obviously much cheaper. But she she this woman sells also uh, like not synthetic wigs. She's and um, she said she, and so there, there's those two possibilities: synthetic or human hair, and it can be a range in prices. And she shared that um, like she's she's connected to Chabad, and the Rebbe Lubavitch said that women should only wear wigs. Okay, so you ask, some of those wigs can look really nice. Has anybody ever noticed that some of those wigs can actually look nicer than one's normal hair, uh, regular hair? So um, she said that, uh, the tar her, her, what she said was that Torah never said that um, you have to look bad. It just says you have to cover your head. <laughs> and, uh, and so she said every woman should feel that out uh, for themselves, like where they feel. She said at a certain point, she was wearing a really, really nice wig. And she said a, a few men started hitting on her, so she kind of, you know, decided on her own to like, you know, wear a different one. But I spoke to a cousin of mine who in Israel went, goes with the tichel, went with the tichel, which is like a, 
a, a hair covering with a scarf. And um, she shared that, you know, the different rabbis have different opinions. Some say that for those reasons that it's not as modest, let's say, with the wig. So the other rabbis will recommend when we're wearing those head coverings. And you see in the show that they, they um, uh, Giti and her daughter, um, Ruhami, remember when Ruhami put on her head covering and then she forgot to wear it um, to the store and she came back and she found it. So that was a tichel. That was like a, that was like a type of tichel, like a head, a head covering that covered her whole head that wasn't a wig. Uh, so she wore that. On the other hand, some, uh, some of the other people wore wigs in the show. So, so you have both, um, and different rabbis support different ones that bring different reasons. But she shared, my cousin shared with regards to the tichel, that um, she found that, number one, it made her feel, um, made it remind her that she's in front of God. So I experienced that with the kippah too, for sure. Um, and uh, women have shared with me with the, who go with wigs, they feel the same thing. Like they're, they notice something different is on them and they feel like they're in God's presence. And she also said that some of these, the nice, nicer wigs or nicer, t- nicer head coverings, uh, they give you a sense, she said it gave her a feeling of, she's not, she doesn't even go with one right now. So they gave her a feeling of royalty, a certain feeling of like she's, like she's special, like a, a daughter of Hashem. And she said that that was, that was powerful. And she said that she felt differently when she had one and when she doesn't. She said it helped, this is her last thing she said, it helps center her. Like it, it gathers the hair and it gathered her energy. And I think I feel that way too when I wear my head covering kind of gathers you and focuses you and centers you. And uh, she shared actually that now she's not wearing one. She feels kind of like scattered. I don't, but I don't know if it's only connected to that. It can be connected to other uh, elements, factors in her life. But so that's just like a little bit on that. Um, there's a lot more to be said on that. But it's um, there's uh, one last thing is if you look in the, if you watch in the show, Ruhami, when she puts on her head covering, she covers it all the way up to her ears. And the reason is that they won't, uh, for I understand is they don't want um, any hair exposed at all. Um, others will say that if you have oh, like two finger, two fingers exposed, some say that that aligns with the the the, uh, the contours of a law connected to, to head covering. So there are a lot of opinions on it, but that's what I kind of wanted to discuss a little with you. And the topic of women shaving their heads uh, underneath their wigs or head coverings, that's for our class on unorthodox, if anybody saw that. So we're not going to talk about that now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's do it. Uh, maybe that's another course. I don't know <laughs> if you want next summer or something. I don't know. Okay, so let's do. A, let's move to our uh, our slide show. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, share screen. Okay. Oh, I want to actually share share the, the audio too. One second. Share computer sound. All right, I'm getting good with this Zoom stuff, huh? Finally, by the end of like six months, I've been doing this. Okay, uh, okay, so we're on class four. I'm gonna make this a bit bigger so you can see it. Okay, we're on class four, abyssal of everything. Abyssal of everything, because it was like, I think I, I just wanted to make sure we covered a lot of different topics, uh, and this is a way to kind of just put it all together. So here's our last class, July 8th, abyssal of everything. Um, here are topics I wanted to talk about. Personal prayer, dreams and visions and shtisel, deception and dishonesty and sibling rivalry. Okay, so now if you think about this, because it's like if you've seen the show, try to think of examples of each one of these. Um, the personal prayer actually isn't, isn't as accentuated, but if you think about the deception and dishonesty, it's all over the show. I think that's why people like it. It's like it's all this drama. <laughs> You know, people lie, people betraying. It's like it's like a, it's like a Haredi uh, soap opera or something like that. I don't know. So, um, so personal prayer. I want to start with that, um, and uh, let's start with the clip. Okay, so this clip is from a, one of the weird, probably the weirdest episode. It's a standalone episode. I don't know if you remember this episode. Anybody seen it? Where uh, Kiva and his friend try to discover his friends, go to kind of connect, reconnect with his friend's mother. And it's like a standalone episode. And I saw it in the Facebook groups that people are like, what's up with this episode? They never did anything with it afterwards. Anyway, there's a cool clip in the beginning um, where these Hasidim, uh, where, the, where, where they're praying. So these are actually, that is a Hasid right here. So let me just make this a little bit smaller. So they're praying in the woods. Now, prayer in Judaism, when we understand prayer, people are like, oh, I miss praying so much. 
we haven't been able to go to shul. Well, if you read the Bible, the Tanakh, they didn't always have a shul. They had sent they had temples or places, things that they altars that they built. But when Abraham or Isaac or Sarah, um, they were talking to Hashem, they were talking to Hashem. Oftentimes outside, as they were walking, and Judaism um, has a lot. If you just read the Bible, it's all about personal prayer. And there's, I mean, just, there's a distinction between personal and formal prayer. This text um, kind of highlights that. Like, why do we pray three times a day? One opinion says the prayers were instituted by the patriarchs. This is from a Sechet Brachot, Tract Day Brachot. Rabbi Yeshua says the prayer were instituted based on the daily offerings in the temple. I really like this source because in the temple they, they offered uh, offerings three times a day. And, and the, the forefathers, they prayed, uh, each forefather prayed at a different part of the day. So that's why I pray three times. You could just say this is just two sources, but you could say this really hints to two forms of prayer. The prayer of the forefathers, who prayed outside to Hashem personally, and the formal prayer, which is sacrifices in the temple. And so you really have two types of prayer. We, we're really good on coming to shul and well, most of the time praying in between talking. No, we're really good at coming to shul and praying. But... Listen, you can also talk to Hashem throughout the day. And uh, it's something very powerful. And one of the rabbis who spoke about this the most is Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. He said, go out to the woods, talk to Hashem like you would, uh, like you would a child to their parents. So here's an example of that from the show. So right now, I think I've told this in another setting, but this individual is screaming, Abba. Okay, so I'll tell you a 10 second story. I was in Tzfat in, in Israel. And I, this is a true story. And I was going out to the woods to do this. I was going to pray to Hashem in the woods there. And it was the very beginning of my experience. I passed 10 seconds, 20 seconds. So, uh, and I was going out to the woods to pray. And I heard somebody screaming, Abba, Abba. And I was freaked out. I told my friends, like, what's happening? Because that's what people do. They scream to Hashem in the woods like that really, really loud. So if you ever experience that, it's, uh, you don't have to call uh, 911. It could be that somebody is just praying to Hashem. And maybe... Uh, uh, so here's an example of that. I love this right now. So he's literally just sitting and talking to Hashem like a friend. And Rabbi Nachman Abrezzo says that's what you should do. I just kept that in there because it can get kind of annoying, actually, <laughs> when you go to these places and they're, like, screaming in the background. Sometimes it's very distracting. So you have to find the right location. Okay, but um, I just want to show you this text here. This is Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. His stuff is awesome. If you can get your hands on it, um, he has a lot of stuff on personal prayer, talking to Hashem. It's very good to pour out your heart to God like a child pleading with his father or mother. Doesn't God call us his children? Your children to the Lord your God. Therefore, it is good to express your thoughts and feelings and all your troubles to God, like a child nagging and complaining to his father. Even if you think you've done so much wrong that you are no longer one of God's children, remember that God still calls you his child, as the rabbis taught. For better or worse, you are always called his children. Okay, so this model, in synagogue, we don't always experience God as, the, as father, as parent. It's more a um, commander sometimes or... So, or some other model, but this idea of connecting to God like a, like a parent, you know, you don't only connect to your parent, uh, and, and you connect to your parent all the time. You can nag them and ask them for things. And so that's kind of like what they were doing in this episode, in that, in that excerpt, that video. Okay, so I want to move on to the next topic here, but are there any, uh, any chat, uh, any questions or anything, Shira? I'm looking. I don't see anything right now. Okay. So somebody asked last episode, last episode, last uh, last segment of the show, um, of this lecture series, they asked about for me to interpret the dreams. 
of the sh in Stissel. So I just want to point out, if you go on these Facebook groups for Stissel, people see Stissel like Torah. I wish people learned Torah the same way, to be honest with you. Like, they ask questions, and then what, Elisheva, and Kiva, and why didn't it work out with this, and what's that dream about? Some people, so I posted, uh, like, to prepare for this class, I posted in one of the forums, like, what's up with dreams in Stissel? And you should see, I received like so many interesting comments. And this one gentleman had all these explanations that were like so creative. And he, and he kind of even sent me a private message. So there was a lot to say. I, what I did, I kind of tried to go through the different episodes um, and just highlight the different dreams and visions. Um, and I want to show you one of them and talk about that. I mean, each one has a different track. So Shulam has visions with his wife of uh, Devorah. In different, it's not necessarily dreams. He has one dream. He has visions of his wife in different instances, and they hint to him. My thinking is the dreams in the show, they're oftentimes what we talked about before. Um, they're, they're there to reflect the soul's yearnings and, this, and like an inner truth. So because, we, remember we talked about that last week, dreams can, be, um, dreams can be true if you're a true person, and they can also like hint to, to deeper, um, deeper truths. The show takes them seriously, and you'll see it inserts them in different parts to, um, to point to where the person is on, on their inside. And so that's kind of like, so this example, Kiva's mother, she said it's cold in the very, very beginning of the first episode. Uh, she's in, the, in Anshin, the, the restaurant. She says, it's cold, and there's no pickles. And so that was the question I asked on that Facebook group. And a lot of people said that, you know, it's Kiva's feeling like his life is cold without his mom, and he misses her, and that dream come to... Uh, come to like reflect that and perhaps that kind of laying the ground for the for the first season where he's trying to fill that void with Elisheva um although that that and it was like kind of like an unhealthy relationship in a way but um she was he, he's always struggling with that 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 piece of like um the, the woman piece and trying to find um trying to find trying to maybe fill that void so here is um and there's another point where uh Kiva in episode 11, I guess the end of the first season already. And Kiva is um, in the studio and he's about to draw Elisheva, paint her. And she goes and she brings her wedding dress and he falls asleep and he dreams of his mother crying. And then he can't paint her anymore because he, he, he realizes maybe, uh, maybe he's like not doing something right. That was, that's how I understand that dream. I just wanna show you, um, there's a lot of other ones here. You can, you can try to like remember them. Um, based on, you also have at the very end, you have, um, very end of the list here, you have Elisheva's visions with her husbands. So all this reflects, I think, where they are on their inside. And this, and we talked about dreams can have nonsense in that too. And, uh, and so, and, but these dreams kind of reflect certain truths. So I want to show you this dream with, uh, this isn't a dream, but this is a vision of Kiva's, which wasn't true. It was, I mean, it was true in the sense it taught him something, but it was a vision. It didn't happen in real life. And he thought it was completely true. If anybody knows what I'm talking about, this is, a, uh, this is where he envisions a kid, a child, who is lonely and hungry and thirsty and looking for companionship. And Kiva brings him in. And it was that kid with the, uh, with the, with the fish. You remember that, the goldfish. He brings him in, takes care of him. And then I think it teaches <laughs> Kiva something very deep about himself. So I want to show you that. שלום חמוד, אני חושב שכדאי שתחזור למטה לשבת על ספסל. מפחד שאימא והבא יגיעו והם לא יראו אותך שם והם ידאגו. אני לא רוצה להיות לבד. חס ושולם, אתה לא לבד, עוד מעט אימא תבוא. גם אתה קראי. Oh, sorry. 
עוד. חזר לאמהות שלהם. וככה תשאיר אותי שם? מה פתאום? אני אהיה איתך כל הזמן. אל תדאג. So my feeling with this vision, it turns out this vision was a vision, meaning it, this kid wasn't real. But for Kiva, it was real. He ended up painting him in a, it was a, in a beautiful painting um, with the fish and everything. I think that this, uh, I think that this vision hints to Kiva, uh, kind of like, he says, yeah, I'm going to bring you back. Uh, I'm going to help you find your mother. Kiva's kind of searching for his mother. And he ends up embracing the child. I sense that there may be like an embracing of himself and uh, of his inner child. That's how I understood that vision. He brought him in. He accepted him. He understood what he was going through. And maybe it was kind of Akiva getting, Akiva getting in touch with his feelings with regards to his mom and his feelings of being alone. That's how I understand that. That's a little bit on just some of the visions and dreams in the show. I'm going to ask uh, um, Shira. I saw some people typing things about wakes in China and stuff. Oh, yeah. One second. Um, someone said there's a concern about the wigs from China, suspicion that the hair is forcibly taken from prisoners. And then someone else said that the boy with the fish reminded uh, them of the boy in Hadassah's painting, which is what you just said. Right? Hadassah's painting. He had been in, the, in Hadassah's studio. Beth Goldstein said that. He did paint painting of that of that kid, so that could be what she's talking about. Um, okay, so I want to I want to talk about the, uh, this next topic, which is like a this is like a like a central topic, uh, a central theme. So let me uh, share that share the screen with you again. I'm sorry. Were you going to respond to the comment about the about the, about the wig? Yeah. So I, I don't, someone, I don't, else said, someone else said it's been disproven. Someone else said that. So I don't have any, haven't done any research on that. You don't know about it. Okay. It, yeah. So um, that, that, I, that does sound like a horrible thing. Though. I mean, I, I have to look into that. Um, they, the women, as they presented it to me, I spoke to two, one, one, two women, one who sells wigs and one who helps yeah. uh, like, uh, upkeep them and sell and is about selling them. Right. They didn't mention anything about that to me. But I haven't heard that either. Like, and someone else just said real quick, um, it was an inspiration for him to search within himself. Ah, so it wasn't like him getting in touch with himself, but it was like pointing him to not look towards the outside, but to look towards the inside. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. If you have any other interpretations of any of the dreams or visions, put them in the, in the chat section. I'm going to move on. I will take a look at that a little bit later. All right. So here is the next topic, which is Okay, dishonesty and deception. Okay, so anybody remember these scenes? These two scenes? Um, okay, this first scene is when Sviaria is, he's, he, wants, he wants to see who really loves him, basically. <laughs> so he, he says he's not feeling well. It says, says, since I haven't been feeling well for a while, this is when he first comes out and says he's not feeling, he, may, he, comes, he, he, he fabricates an illness to see who really loves him who, and kind of like to see where his wife is in relation to him. And that's like one, one case. There's many of these, many of these, of these situations. It's another situation when Shulam uh, comes to Kiva's, um, his, his, the war, I think yeah. it was like his award ceremony. And uh, he ends up sabotaging it. Kiva thinks he's coming to support him, but he, in, the, in truth, he's really coming to, uh, to like sh to to fundraise with right. all the, the the successful people um, who are who are all the uh, all the wealthy people who are going to be there. So that was kind of like also like a deception, and and again and it's it's much worse. So what I want to talk about is uh, the place of of truth in Judaism at when sometimes when it negates other values like peace or love or caring for the other. And there are many cases in the show. Some are clearer than others. So I'm going to go through a few different cases with you. All right. The first case that I want to discuss is, uh, Shira, can you uh, mute everybody, please? I'm hearing a little bit. Um, the first case, aside from me, of course. All right. The first case that I want to talk about, if anybody remembers this gentleman, Leib Fuchs. 
this, uh, I think that's his name, uh, uh, Leib Fuchs. He was, uh, a, he was a paint, he was a famous artist, but he wasn't really an artist. He had all these people uh, paint, paint pictures for him and he would just put his name on it. And Kiva got caught up in all that. And his first fiance was like, what are you doing? That's dishonest. And he, eventually he got out of it. But, um, so that's a clear case, I would say, of dishonesty, deception that we feel uncomfortable with. I would, I would think everybody would agree with that. Um, you could say the Fuchs is trying to make money for his family, but there's no, there's no really excuse for that. So that's something that I would, it's like, it's the negative behavior. But here's another case. Each one gets a little bit lighter. So this one is a very complicated case. By the way, it took me a little while to get all these pictures like a line like this. Um, so if you remember this, uh, this is the Zelig. So Giti is um, about, she's pregnant and they see an ad for a woman who's willing to pay a lot of money so that Giti will name, the, the, that the, a woman who's carrying a baby will name the baby after her, her, uh, I think it was her deceased husband, whose name was Zelig. Now they go for an interview and, uh, and in the end, Gitya says, We're, we'll do it for free. Well, Lipe, her husband, had different ideas and he goes behind her back. This is the, where that, that's the first picture here, to go get money, a small amount for naming the baby Zelig. In the meanwhile- I was so angry when I saw that. I really was, it made me so angry. And it just was the height of dishonesty and I just was so angry when I saw it. But okay, I don't well, know if anybody else was when they saw it, but it just <laughs> made me feel- I agree. Like disgrace. Okay, so good. So you're, you're on the side of the dishonesty and deception in this case is a bad thing, which I am too. And I hope uh, probably everyone is. But I want to show that there was something here um, was interesting in this show. What did, so I'll, I'll tell, this, tell this piece and I'll tell you what good came out of this. So they ended up, um, he, 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 got, he took the money from this, this wealthy woman. Gitti, in the meanwhile, says, I don't want to name the baby after, I'm, I'm freaked out by this woman, I don't want to name the baby Zelig. He already took the money, invested it somewhere. So he, he had to go, he, he, wanted to, he wanted to go forward with naming the baby anyway. They had the bris, and that's the picture on the bottom, and he ends up uh, calling the baby Zelig, and she didn't even know it. And it was, it was because he, he already put the money away and he accepted the money. He couldn't go back on, on his commitment to that woman. So the, Gitti was, was like shocked and she was overwhelmed and sad and kind of like, it was a very intense moment in the show. Later on, uh, he ends up investing that money and they use that money grows and they end up using it to build a business for Gitti and for the family. So I brought this because it's like, it's, it's a horrible thing. Something good came out of it in the end. So I'm just saying, I'm bringing different cases of deception in the show. And when they, it's like, perhaps Lipe wanted to help his family. So maybe someone could argue, I'm not saying I am. Someone could argue maybe that he did it for the sake of his family and it, it did end up paying off. So the question is, does this honesty, is it a worthwhile thing if, it, if it's going to bring positive results? Uh, Judaism, for the most part, says no. But I want to bring you a few cases, though, that uh, from from Chazal, from the sages, that that do show it's not a hundred percent black and white. All right, here's another case. Anybody remember this? This is from the very beginning of the show. Uh, Shulin's mother uh, got a t she um, she brought a TV into her room, which is like a huge. I mean, they didn't watch Dissel, okay, because they didn't have a TV. Um, They're only being filmed. What? Uh, for the show um but so they she brought a tv in and then sviaria goes behind her back while she's in the other room outside the hallway unplugs it from the wall and basically like um not just unplugs it but kind of like completely uh uh rem it completely damages it uh, damages the connection so she can't watch the sh her tv anymore and she mistakenly she she innocently would he knew that she innocently would think that the tv just broke and he was hoping she wouldn't watch TV anymore. This is a, a, a deceptive act. He's going behind her back, not telling her he's, he's doing it. Is this right? Or I mean, it's not nearly as bad as Lee Fuchs and the previous case, but 
Is this completely bad? In the end, she ends up saying, remove the TV for me. So this is another case. Here's the last case I want to show you. This is, um, I think that people might feel that there's an argument to be made for this type of deception or dishonesty. Um, this is a case with Ruhami, where she, um, she, she knows that her father's away, and she's sad that her brother is not in connection with her father. So she ends up, and he needs it, her brother. So she ends up writing a letter, like a ghost, ghost letter, in her father's name to her brother while he's away, because he wasn't, he wasn't staying in touch. Okay, so I didn't bring the whole thing, but she writes as a brain in two letters. And I think it's, I, it's like a cool scene when she has like that fake, I don't know if it's a fake cigarette or a real cigarette. She's trying to like, I think she's trying to, trying, trying to show that she's seeing herself like in a position of maybe like power or she, I don't know, trying to assume some sort of role um, in writing that letter like a parent would. So, um, so this case here, she's writing a letter to her brother, made her brother happy and eased his nerves, didn't harm anybody. So is this completely wrong or not? Um, and basically the question is, is it, the show has a lot of dishonesty. Is it always forbidden in Judaism to lie? Is it always forbidden? So I wanted to, I want to show you a few sources which show that it's not completely clear cut. Again, my rabbi said, Rabbi Chaim Kenny Cohen said that um, he is proud of himself, that, he, that he's, he said that he's, tries to model himself after his rabbis and never say lies. So as much as you can be honest in Judaism, that's, that's the ideal. But there's sometimes situations where values conflict. And so here are two cases, of, two cases in Chazal's conflicting values. I'll just name the first one for because uh, we're kind of rushed in terms of uh, time here. But Rabban Shem Shimon Megamiel, this is about Chapters of the Fathers. On three things does the world stand, on justice, on truth, and on peace. We have justice, truth, peace. And these are different, different values. And sometimes you might have the value of peace, which might conflict with the value of truth. And then you're faced with a, a tough decision. Ruhami knew it was dishonest to write that letter, but she wanted to bring peace and comfort to her brother. So those are two values that conflicted. And so here are cases in the sages where they sometimes will... Uh, will um, Embrace another value when it conflicts with the value of truth. So there's a case from straight from the Torah, with, and this is brought in Yavamot 65b, um, that God lies for the sake of peace. Okay, so that's truth versus peace, and God, uh, uh, God um, ended up on the side of peace in, in this situation. So it says uh, Sarah was saying about her husband that she's he's old. And that, uh, that her husband's old. And Hashem said, when he repeated the story to, to Abraham, he said that Sarah said that she herself was old. So Hashem changed the, Hashem changed the, Hashem changed the language for the sake of peace. So Abraham wouldn't think that Sarah was saying he was old. That's one case. This other case, I'm not going to read it, but I'll just tell you. It says Aaron, used, it says Aaron, uh, Aaron uh, Cohen, the Cohen, our, our, our forefather Aaron, he loved peace so much that he would go around and try to foster peace between people. So he would say he saw a couple that was fighting. he come up to the, the husband and say, you know what, I spoke to your wife. She forgave you. She's speaking all these uh, uh, praiseworthy words uh, about you. And then he went to the, and, he goes, he, and the husband's like, really? I didn't know that. That's good to hear. And he went to the wife and guess, guess what? Your husband, he loves you. I mean, you're, they were in a fight. But he says, your husband, he's sorry for everything he did. He loves you and he wants to make up. The couple used to come back together and unite because uh, Aaron kind of warmed up their hearts. And so he used to do this sometimes with people. And you could say he's lying, but the sages don't critique him for it. They say this is a positive thing in order for, for the sake of peace. So sometimes when peace, peace conflicts with truth, 
Sometimes people can side on the side of peace. It's very complicated because who knows when you're really seeking out peace. Uh, um, that painter in the show, Leib Fuchs, could said, this is for the peace of my family. I need money. Obviously, it's not always right. But I'm just showing you that it's not always black and white. Here are three. This is the classic Gemara from Baba Metzia, and then we'll move on to the next topic. But I see people adding in the comments in the chat section, which is great. Um, Baba Metzia says, with regard to these three matters, it is normal for sages to amend their statements and deviate from the truth. So, and this is for the sake of humility or protect some, to protect somebody from harm. So let's say somebody comes up to Rabbi Yoga. They say, Rabbi Yoga, how many, how many traits, tractates of Gemara did you like? How many episodes of Stitzel did you watch for this show? So I would be tempted to say, well, I watched a few of them, but I'm going to say, no, I only watched one or two. And I kind of, you can kind of change your, your language for the sake of humility. I didn't learn the whole Gemara all, all the time. When I learned a few Masechtas, and even that I don't remember, you know, you can kind of like, if you need to change, change the truth for the sake of your own humility, you, you might be able to do that, the Talmud says. And uh, with regards to a bed, um, and regards to, um, uh, to a host, let's say you went to somebody's house, okay? And they, someone asked you, how was the food there? So if the food was horrible, you probably shouldn't say that. If the food was amazing, maybe you shouldn't say that too. Why? Because then everybody will start knocking on that family's door and they won't have any rest, okay? That's what the Talmud says. You can be, you should, you sometimes can change your language to protect somebody, even if it means that everybody's going to be knocking on their door for food because the food tastes so good. So here are a few examples. The Maharal says that you should always try, no matter what, no matter, I forget the language. He says, no matter what kind of what you see in our tradition about these, 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 uh, these loopholes um, or kind of like conflicting values um, and sometimes siding with the other value aside from that's not the, the value of truth, he says we should always always, always seek out truth and try to be as true and honest as possible. So I'm just trying to show you that there are sides in our tradition which do highlight other values and they conflict with truth. And this is not completely black and white. And the show highlights it, I think, to a fault. Uh, there's a lot of dishonesty, too much in the show. Uh, but uh, I don't know if, if everybody would be watching all the time, if it wasn't, wasn't all that dishonesty, it makes it kind of interesting. So I just want to kind of show you it's not black and white. But we, but, um, but, and there are certain cases where, where you can deviate. Um, all right, so I saw uh, some comments being added. Do you want to um, share some of them with me, Sharon? Yeah, there's more talk about the hair. People are going back and forth about that. Um, I'm, can you see that? Uh, I don't want to open it up because I'll lose. My oh, okay. Um, right. Some people are saying that, you know, there's sources that say that it's from, you know, not a good place like child labor or other things and someone says something interesting and i agree that the orthodox community would be very careful with where they get the hair so even if there probably is it's possible i think if it's possible that there is truth to it i don't think that it, our community would be using it from that source that's my opinion i hope um, the case but I, i'm not i'm not as sure as you are to be honest you're not oh okay yeah. <laughs> Um, but I'll send it to you an email, the actual comments, okay? And right. then, um, uh, let's see what else. So we're, at, we're, at, we're, at, we're supposed to go to 1205? Yeah. So uh, if you if you could uh, allow me like another five minutes, we're at 1203, so like so 1208. Yeah, I'm, I'll copy these and I'll send it to you, okay? okay. All right, so I want to do this last topic. Um, sibling rivalry, okay? So... This is, uh, uh, somebody asked about this sibling rivalry, and I have two, two comments to make on sibling rivalry in Judaism. If you think about it, let me just actually unshare my screen. If you think about it in Judaism, uh, and if, you, if you're a fan, if you're a Bible, um, if, you're, if you're familiar with the Bible, if you've ever read Parashat Shavua, there's a lot of sibling rivalry. Uh, Esav and Yaakov, Ishmael, um, and, and Yitzchak, um, the brothers, and it doesn't stop there. It goes on all throughout Tanakh. Um, the tribes, the king of Judah, uh, the tribe, of, uh, the, the kingdom of Judah versus the kingdom of Israel. And there's a lot of conflict and sibling robbery in the Torah. So the question is, what's that come to teach us? And in addition, is it always what, as it appears on the surface? Those are the two, two pieces I want to talk about. But I want to talk about that on the backdrop of a sibling rivalry in the show. There's a, a very serious thing between Nachum and Shalom. And so I put together a little montage here, a short one, two minutes, which is 
this whole interaction where uh, Nach, uh, Shulam is upset with Nachum because he's not, he never came to visit his mom over all the years. He's upset with him. He makes him sign on this, like, this note in order to give him a loan. Makes him sign on this note that he didn't take care of his mother properly. And Nachum ends up doing it. Um, Nachum, of course, that's not the final word. Uh, he didn't want to give Shulam the final word. So he finds a way to trap Shulam. And I just want to show you in, this, in, this, in, the, in these clips here, where he basically, Shalom says, I would never, I, I'm not like obsessed with money. I would never sell, I would, so wouldn't sell my plot next to my, par- next to my wife and near my family, next to my, my parents and my wife. I would never sell for a million dollars, even to the, to the Belgians, uh, uh, Belgians, uh, Belgians. And he, and uh, his brother, Nachum is from uh, Belgium, and he hears that, he says, oh, really? Let me see how pure and how, uh, how, um, how straight and na- narrow you are. If I give you, if I, if I tempt you with a lot of money, maybe you'll succumb. And he ended up, he actually ended up succumbing for, for a specific reason. But uh, I want to share that with you. It's just a funny, like it's a funny, it's a funny few segments when they're connected. על יד נמצא גם הגבר של דבוילה. ופה באמצע בין שתיכם, שתיים וחצי אמות של אדמה הזה שפה באמצע, זה שלי בא. שתיים וחצי אמות של אדמה פה בירושלים, בין שתיכם. ואני באמס ובסוג מרגיש יהודי בר מזל. זה בשבילי מאמן, שווה יותר מכל הון שבעולם, יותר מהבניינים והמשרדים והמטוסים של האמריקאים והצרפתים ו- 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 והבלגים. הלו? מה שלומך רב שטיסל? זה זוסמן של החבר'ה קדישה. השלושים כבר היה אתמול. אין דבר ידוע, לא בשביל זה אני מתקשר. נו. אתה שומע, התקשר איזה צרפתי, והוא רוצה לקנות את הריבוע שלכם. מה? איזה ריבוע? חלקת הקבר שלכם, ה... הקבר הפנוי שם בחלקה. ויש לו שם איזה עניין עם הנוף שם, או משהו. אל תשאלי ממני צחוק, זוסמן. מה צחוק? חוץ בשולם, ברצינות. מה ברצינות? אתה חושב שאני אמכור את הקבר שלי שמוכן לי על יד אשתי או לאו השלום ועל יד אימא שלי או לאו השלום? בסדר, חשבתי שזה מה שתענה, אבל אמרתי בכל זאת, 11 אלף דולר, צריך לבדוק את זה. 11 אלף דולר? זה מה שהוא מציע. $11,000, that's another story. He ends up selling it for a certain reason. And, uh, the, and his, brother, his brother poses as a Frenchman and offers this $11,000 and, and he ends up selling it. So, he, so he ends, it's the whole sibling rivalry is back and forth. And I want to just show you two sources and then we'll kind of like, um, we'll, we'll uh, wrap it up. Show you two sources. One is from my, one of my rabbis, Rabbi Avi Weiss. He has a really great article. Um, It's a really great article. The article is called um, Nation as Family, not his family, it should be Nation as Family. And he talks about all this sibling rivalry, and he says that the Torah is a blueprint for how we should approach the nation. We should approach Am Yisrael as our family. Now, I think this is Rab Avi Weiss's innovation. I told him this, actually. I think it's one of his innovations in terms of Jewish thought. Loving your neighbor as yourself because they're like your family. And he says, family, they go through challenges and struggles, and that's what the Torah tries to highlight. But in the end, the end vision of the Torah, which he lists here, is that the, the, the tree of Ephraim will come and join the tree of Joseph, a uh, uh, tree of Joseph will jo- join the tree of Judah, and there'll be unity. And so he tries to show that just like a family that goes through ups and downs and there's rivalries, that that's for a purpose. The Torah, and the Torah actually ends, the Tanakh, the Torah ends uh, with a happy ending. The brothers come together, uh, but the Tanakh does not end in a happy way. 
the two kingdoms disperse and they don't come together. He said, I think I asked him this question once. He said that that's to teach us that we, Am Yisrael, have to, to complete that work of coming together as a nation, seeing ourselves as a family and overcoming our petty rivalries. Okay, so I think that's a really beautiful model. Because if you view somebody else, uh, I guess with this I'll end, because I have one more piece, but uh, this is a good ending. So if you view the, another individual as your family, imagine what you do for your family, for your brother, your sister, your children. You do anything for them. If you view another Jew as your family, you go uh, beyond yourself to help them in all kinds of ways. And Rabbi Weiss, he called in his synagogue the bite, which is the house. And he wanted to create this whole environment of Judaism as a house and as a family. It's a whole new perspective, and nobody really talks about it. And he writes about it in this article. He says, the Tanakh is all stories about families and how to get along in your family. I once gave a, lecture, a sermon on this, how to get along with your Meshuggah family. Um, so maybe we'll send that out or something. But uh, so that's kind of like the idea of, of uh, Rabbi Weiss. So sibling rivalry does appear throughout Jewish tradition. I'll just name what Rav Cook says on this. And... Uh, of Cook talks about how the tree, if you see in the bottom, where the tree comes together. Of Cook says the fight between the brothers wasn't, a, super, wasn't a, a superficial fight. It was a deep fight. They were battling for what the purpose, what, the, what, what should be at the forefront of the nation. Should be our physical, um, our physical dimension or our spiritual. Judah highlighted the, the spiritual. Um, Joseph, the physical. And Joseph ended up supporting everybody in, in a material way. And their debate was not something superficial or petty. So, so this is a, what, I, what I want to say is that the term when it talks about rivalries, you have to look a little bit deeper and try to understand what the depth of them are. And, and the message is that even if you have deep ideological differences with other people, not just petty ones like in the show, but deep ideological ones, it's important still to try to overcome that because we are all are one big family. So I think those are two points connected to that, to the, to the rival, that, that we're like a family, number one. Number two, that even if they're deep, rivalries, or ideological ones. We still have to see each other as a family member. So that's, uh, I'm gonna just kind of like return to you. And uh, so that's kind of like sums up our course on Stissel. There's a lot more to be said. I think we covered a lot of interesting topics. And the main, main takeaway I think from the show, one of the main takeaways from the show is to be open, maybe this connects to this last piece, to be open to other sectors of, of Judaism. Uh, this show gave, gives us a window into them and you're not gonna get, you're not gonna always agree with them and there's gonna be differences, but we all are one big family. I think this show is really helping foster that. If you look on the Facebook page, um, there's 21,000 people, 21,000 on the Stissel Facebook page called Stissel, let's talk about it. And uh, there's people who had no connection, to, they don't have, aren't as connected to Judaism and the show brought them closer. And so um, I think that's a positive thing about the show is helping us connect to each other better. And I think that's really what we need. We need to connect to each other, especially uh, in these times when we're disconnected, trying to think of ways to connect to each other as much as possible.